So I'm curious, who put the Gatorade on my pulpit this morning? <laughs> if, if you're not on Facebook, then you didn't see the little meme, the, the poster that went around saying that, you know, basically, if you're a good Christian, you should be as excited about church as you are about the Super Bowl. So if your pastor says something good, you should dump a bucket of Gatorade over his head. <laughs> so I planned a very bad sermon for you. <laughs> For the last several weeks, we've been going over the I Am statements in the Gospel of John. These I Am statements offer us a kind of autobiography that helps us know and understand our Savior, Jesus Christ, better. In our passage today, Jesus invites us to know Him as our Good Shepherd. So let us pray. Lord God, as always, we thank You for the gift of Your Word in Scripture for the way that it speaks to us and changes us sometimes when we're not looking. We don't even know it's happening. But we pray that it would again today. Lord, take this word and plant it deeply within our hearts and cause it to grow and bear fruit for your kingdom. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We're picking up, if you were here last week, we started a section where Jesus was talking about being the door for the sheep. And we're picking up right after that where he's continuing with this sheep and shepherd analogy. But here Jesus shifts gears to say that he is the good shepherd. And so he begins in verse 11 of chapter 10 saying, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, since the Steelers are out of the Super Bowl, not in the Super Bowl, I haven't been thinking much about game this week. What I have been thinking about are sheep. Because of this passage, Jesus talking about being the good shepherd, which implies that we are his sheep. And so I got to thinking, what are sheep like, really? Some of you have had more uh, closer experiences with sheep than I have. But what are sheep like? Because I wonder, what does it say about us that Jesus would call us his sheep? And I read a lot of interesting things, as far as the internet's concerned, at least. There's some great information out there. And it seems to fall into two camps. On the one side, sheep are about the dumbest animals <laughs> on the planet. Okay? They, they are directionless. They, they, they can recognize the voice of their shepherd, but sometimes they'll follow who knows who, and they'll follow each other. I even read a story about some sheep in Turkey a few years back that followed their leader, which was one of the other sheep, right off a cliff. The entire herd went off the cliff. Their shepherds had left them untended. So, I mean, I feel bad for the sheep. That's pretty dumb <laughs> to walk off the cliff, right? And they're defenseless. They have no defense mechanism. They kind of bunch together, but they're easily picked off by wolves and other predators. So they're not very smart. They're not very tough. And so some of what I read was just how dumb and how bad sheep are. And if that's the case, it's not very flattering that Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, you sheep. <laughs> but there is also another side. Some of the other information I read, which was mostly by actual shepherds, people who have had very close experience with sheep as, as a part of their career, they say that, yeah, sheep can wander a bit, and yeah, they don't have any defenses, but they're actually quite intelligent animals, and they have a lot of individual personality from sheep to sheep, which is why some shepherds are known to name each one of the sheep, and you call that sheep by name, it's going to come to you. 
And they herd together as a safety mechanism because, yeah, one might get picked off, but they are better together and they know that. So sheep are really pretty smart and very, very lovable. And if that's the case, well, that sounds a bit better than Jesus would call us his sheep. But the one thing that's in common in both of those camps, whether sheep are dumb or sheep are smart, both sides agree that sheep need a shepherd. Sheep need a shepherd. Sheep were domesticated about 12,000 years ago, which means that for all intents and purposes, sheep as we know them today are made to require a shepherd. And so are we. Which is why Jesus calls himself our good shepherd. Jesus, in this passage, has been accusing the religious leaders of being bad shepherds, of not doing a good job caring for God's people. In the passage today he compares them to a higher hand who runs away at the first sign of danger. For sure, he'll do his job as long as he's making some money, but he's not going to put his own life on the line for the sheep. Jesus says that's what the religious leaders have been like. They've been caring a little bit for God's people, but not really putting their life on the line to care for the most vulnerable among them. The higher hand, Jesus <coughs> says, is not the shepherd. He cares more for himself than for the sheep. But Jesus is the good shepherd. And he wants us to understand why. What is it that makes him such a good shepherd of us, his sheep? The first thing that Jesus explains that makes him such a good shepherd is simply the fact that he lays down his life for the sheep. This is clearly a reference to the cross. Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. He says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, I know my own, and my own know me, and I lay down my life for the sheep. It's one of the most central Christian beliefs. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And Jesus purchased our freedom and our adoption into the flock, into the family of God's people. Like a good shepherd, Jesus was willing to lay down his life to protect us, to watch over us, to make sure that we can stay apart. But just as important as the fact that Jesus died for us is how and why Jesus died for us. How and why Jesus laid down his life for the sheep. Jesus didn't just die. Jesus died willingly. He said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. To the rest of the world, when Jesus was nailed to that cross, it looked like he had failed. After all, that was the standard form of Roman execution. That's when the government says, you are a bad person and we are getting rid of you. You fail. You lose. And so it looked like Jesus and all of his followers had lost. But Jesus says, that's not what's going to happen. He's speaking ahead of the fact here. He says, nobody takes my life. The Roman Empire is not going to execute me. That's what it's going to look like. But I lay down my life willingly. I know the cross is coming, and I choose to go to it. The rest of the world, his death looked like a failure, but in truth, it was his greatest victory. Because Jesus was simply obeying what his Father had sent him to do, and obedience is never a failure. Even if it costs you your own life, obedience is never a failure. Jesus died willingly for our sins. Jesus then goes on to explain why he laid down his life. And he says it was for the sake of his Father's love. He says, for this reason my Father loves me, because I lay down my life. Now, in English that sounds a bit as though Jesus laid down his life so that the Father would then love him. The Greek, in the Greek it sounds a bit more like this. I lay down my life for this reason, because my Father loves me. Jesus knew that he was loved by his Father. That is why he was willing to lay down his life. Because my Father loves me. Now, isn't that fascinating? That Jesus says that's why he died on the cross. is because of his Father's love. Not to forgive you and me of my sins, 
Although that's part of it, that's certainly a part of what happens, that's part of the result, but it's not the ultimate reason. The reason Jesus went to the cross was for his Father's love. Because Jesus knew that he was loved by his Father. Forgiveness and salvation are the result of his death, but the reason is the love of his Father. Only people who know they are loved are capable of willingly laying down their lives for a great cause. And Jesus knew that he was loved by his Father. There's a great paragraph in G.K. Chesterton's book, uh, Orthodoxy, which illustrates this idea of being willing to lay down your life simply because you know you are loved. In his example, he's using a section of the city of London that's called Pimlico. I think that's how you pronounce it. Which at the time, he says, was a very unpleasant place to live. So this is what he says. He says, let us suppose we are confronted with a desperate thing, say, Pimlico, this neighborhood in London. It is not enough for a man to disapprove of Pimlico. In that case, he will merely cut his throat or move to Chelsea. No, nor certainly is it enough for a man to approve of Pimlico, for then it will remain Pimlico, which would be awful. The only way out of it seems to be for somebody to love Pimlico. To love it with a transcendental tie and without any earthly reason. If there arose a man who loved Pimlico, then Pimlico would rise into ivory towers and golden pinnacles. If men loved Pimlico as mothers love children, arbitrarily, because it is theirs, <coughs> Pimlico in a year or two might be fairer than Florence. Now, some readers will say that this is mere fantasy. I answer that this is the actual history of mankind. This, as a fact, is how cities did grow great. Go back to the darkest roots of civilization, and you will find them knotted around some sacred stone or encircling some sacred well. People first paid honor to a spot and afterwards gained glory for it. Men did not love Rome because she was great. She was great because they had loved her. Love is what frees us to do great things, to lay down our life for a great cause, just as the Father's love is the reason that Jesus gave up his. The second thing that makes Jesus our good shepherd is the fact that Jesus has other sheep. This is one of the more fascinating parts of the passage that I don't want us to skip over. Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Now, scholars have argued for centuries about who are these other sheep that Jesus is talking about. Most agree that Jesus probably means the Gentiles. Remember in those days, the Jewish worldview was there are the Jews, the Israelites, the people of God, and everybody else, the Gentiles, the other nations, the other ethnicities, the people that... Eh, maybe God doesn't hate them, but they're not God's people. They're not within the promises of God. They don't have the same benefits with God that the Jewish people do. Most scholars agree that Jesus probably is talking about the Gentiles here, saying, I do have other sheep besides just the people of Israel. Jesus was announcing his intention here to expand the family of God so that it could include people of every tongue, of every color, of every race, of every nation, of every ancestor. Now, a few scholars have gone so far as to suggest that Jesus may have even meant to include people of other religions. Maybe Jesus had in mind people that believed very different things in other parts of the world. There aren't as many of these scholars, and I think it's a harder case to make, but still the possibility remains Jesus is talking about other sheep that he wants to include. Who are these other sheep? We can even take the question further than that. When I was in junior high, I remember distinctly asking my mom one day, what if they discover aliens on a planet in another solar system? What's that going to mean to our Christianity? That's the kind of thing I thought of when I was in junior high. <laughs> aliens in another solar system. I will never forget her response. She thought about it for a minute. She said, well, I suppose that would just have to mean that somehow Jesus is also their Savior. I just walked away that way. I didn't know what to say, but 
But what a wonderful and thoughtful answer. What if there are other sheep that Jesus has? And he doesn't tell me who exactly they are, but he obviously loves them. He wants to bring them in to the family of God. What else should my response be other than to say, well, maybe it could be those people or those people or those people, but all I can say for sure is that if those are the people Jesus is talking about, then he must be inviting them to be saved for him, just as we are. The point is, we don't know who these other sheep are. What we do know is that Jesus is the one who has them. That is how salvation works. We are not saved because we claim Jesus as our Savior. We are saved because our Savior claims us as his own. That is at the very root of salvation. Not knowing who's who and who's in and who's out and who are the other sheep, but who has them. Who is the Savior? Who is the shepherd? of these sheep. And this has enormous implications for how we interact with people, both inside and especially outside the church and outside the Christian religion. Every single human being we meet is potentially one of Jesus' sheep. Whatever they do or don't believe right now, whether they've been a Christian but are now, whether they never have been, whether they're part of another religion, whatever ethnicity, whatever nationality, Whatever they do with their life, whatever their morality, they are potentially one of Jesus' sheep. And if they are saved, they are only saved through Christ, but I don't get to know who's who on the judgment day. All I get to do is assume that person right there might be one of Jesus' sheep. In fact, I should probably assume that Jesus wants them to be, desperately. But I have to love them with the same love with which Jesus has loved me. This means that we as the church should not only be used to, but we should be experts at welcoming outsiders. Welcoming new sheep, like the story I shared with the kids. The point of that story is that Jesus is telling the religious leaders, look, when someone else becomes a follower of me, becomes saved, you had better rejoice about it, even if you don't like who they were or who they are, because I'm rejoicing over them. If you don't rejoice when lost sheep get found, well, you're outside the party, aren't you? That's not a good place to be. The church exists so that it can expand and make more room for new people to join. Jesus has other sheep. And it's our job to do everything we can to make them feel like family. Now finally, the third thing that, Jesus, that makes Jesus such a good shepherd is the fact that he not only lays down his life, but he also takes it up again. He said, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Jesus' work is not finished without his resurrection. The cross brings the forgiveness of sins, but the resurrection brings victory over death. If Jesus had only died on the cross, we would be innocent before God. We would no longer be guilty in our sin, but our case would ultimately be hopeless because we would not have a share in the eternal life of Jesus. That's why Paul says later on in his letter to the Romans, if we were reconciled to God through the death of Jesus, how much more will we be reconciled to God through his life, through the life of Jesus? The death is part of it, but his life is the rest of it. His work is not finished without his resurrection. The cross changes the verdict, but the resurrection reverses the sentence. We are forgiven because of his death. We live and share in his eternal life because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. These are the things that make Jesus our good shepherd. He lays down his life for us. He has other sheep. He has great compassion on other people just as he has had on us. And he has the authority to take up his life again. This is the shepherd that we have. This is the shepherd that walks us through the valley of the shadow of death. Who promises to lead us beside green pastures and quiet waters. This is our good shepherd. One who would lay down his life for us. 
has compassion for us and for outsiders beyond what we can comprehend and gives us a share in his eternal life. I don't know about you, but that makes being a sheep sound pretty good to me. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.